this new video walkthrough of the circle compiler is intended to help you understand the, the capabilities of the compiler in just about an hour. So it's not a tutorial, it's really a walkthrough of some canned examples I have, but they go through at a pretty rapid pace and uh, go through compile time execution, introspection, reflection, domain specific languages and type providers. So um, I hope you uh, enjoyed this video and um, learn a little bit about my, um, my circle endeavor. So uh, the first example here will, uh, we, can t we can take a, a file off the um, file system here that has these five coefficients, five, four, three, two, one, and treat these like power series coefficients. So let's consider writing a function Right here, read file that opens this this file. It reads out the the five values, returns them as a double, and then loops through the array and accumulates each of these values times x to the ith power. So it's an ordinary kind of a, a Taylor expansion. Um, now the issue here is that this file series.txt is a runtime dependency as written. So in standard C++, you could only open files. You can only do I/O at runtime. Um, however, you know, we know what these values are at compile time. So can we perform compile time transformations that have several benefits? First of all, uh, it opens up the code to a lot more optimization because now we know what these values are at compile time. We can expect the LLVM backend optimizer to do a good job, you know, reducing the amount of work the function has to do. And also it eliminates a runtime dependency, which makes it easier to distribute the code and, uh, reduces the amount of error handling you need. Um, so, so what can we do here, right? So first off, we can just tag any statement, most, most any statement with this meta token. So this just means do this thing, but now at compile time. So the storage duration of this vector of double is now compile time. Uh, at runtime, this array will not exist. Uh, but it exists now when we're parsing the code and we can run this initializer at compile time. So this is an ordinary std vector that exists at compile time. And what this lets us do is uh, write an unrolled loop. So if we have meta four, this is a compile time loop, which is necessarily unrolled with respect to runtime, where we have access to each of the values in this, in this vector. So C is now gonna be reflected with values four through one at compile time. And so we expect this to give us a um, a, a single uh, set of inline uh, um, arithmetic operations to evaluate this very quickly. And the final thing to consider is that this read file now is not needed at runtime. So we're gonna change its linkage to inline from external to inline. And what this does is only emits the function definition if the function is used by the assembly. And since now we're not using read function, uh, at runtime, we're only using it at compile time, this definition is not going to be emitted to the binary. So we, we end up um, effectively cleaning up our, our source code so that any evidence of the, the compile time program is gone by the time it's compiled. So let's try compiling this here. And we can feed it a, an initial value. So we just have an ordinary you know, um, A2F call on argv1. So let's evaluate at 0.5, oops. And we see that we can evaluate this, this uh, uh, function with these Taylor coefficients at 0.5 and get 8.0625 out. Um, now there's some cool things to look at here. For instance, if the file uh, can't be opened, we throw a runtime exception and provide it a formatted string indicating what happened, namely that we could not open this file. What does it mean to throw an exception at compile time? So Circle goes pretty far in trying to integrate the application binary interface, which is the low level plumbing for, for a compiler into the compiler front end. So most things that you do, at, you can do at runtime, you can also do at compile time. So you can throw and catch exceptions at compile time. If an exception unrolls through, all the way through uh, uh, the main function of the compiler, it's treated as an uncaught expression and its exception message is extracted and printed as a compile time error. So let's try to intentionally misspell the name of our compile time asset. So what happens when you try to read, read file series.txt? 
Well, we get a nicely formatted compile time exception. It says, could not open file siri.txt. Who created that error? Well, we created that right here. This is our runtime error, right? And also it gives us backtrace information. So it indicates that the meta interpreter through this exception at line 10, column five, it says throw expression executed. So we go to line 10, column five, here's the throw expression. It also indicates what functions it unrolled through. So it unrolled through uh, the vector returning read file function uh, at line 22. So this uh, read file was called at line 22 and here's the definition of it. And we can see that it, um, it unrolled through this function. So we have backtrace information that we generated by throwing an exception using ordinary C++ exception handling at compile time. Let's consider a second example. Uh, this is one of my most, this is one of my favorite examples. It's um, how to stamp a binary with the hash of the Git version used to build it. So um, you can type Git uh, parse, was it Git rev parse head? This like cryptic command gives you back a 40 digit hash. So if you look in Git log, uh, 76B is the most recent commit. And if we get, if we just type this at the command line, we're going to get this hash out. So consider trying to write a, you know, uh, my program dash dash version, where this would print out human readable uh, copyright information and your URL and everything else, but also, you know, some characters from this hash so that if there's a bug, uh, a user can, can make a bug report and precisely indicate which version of the software that they're, they're, they were running. So how do we do this at compile time without having to invoke an external CMake or GNU make or SCON script, right? How do we do this entirely in C++? Well, we can use the POSIX API popen. Popen just takes a shell command as a string, executes the shell command, and captures the terminal output into a file handle. This isn't a file on disk, but this is a kind of a Unix pipe. And then we can just sit on that uh, uh, file handle and keep reading it until it's exhausted right here into a, into a std vector, coerce that std vector into a string, and then check the return code. So if the return code is non-zero right here, that indicates a, an error, and we can throw that string as a runtime error or else just return it for, for nominal execution, right? So this is normal code. There's no compile time anything in here. But our print version does have compile time code. So consider now preparing our compile time format specifier, which will extract 10 of the 40 hash digits, calling capture call in a meta statement, meta meaning it will execute a compile time. So we're gonna, we're gonna execute git ref parse head on the command line uh, in, the work, in the working directory, which should be the directory that holds the source, the translation unit we're, we're currently building. So we're gonna we're going to issue this shell command at compile time and capture its terminal output, which is our 40 digit hash. We're going to use sprintf at compile time to uh, format the, the message. And then this is uh, one of the many new circle keywords, string, which will marshal data from a string known at compile time to a string literal. So we, we can't just use this pointer, a pointer to this array at runtime, because this array is a compile time array. By the time the compiler's process finishes, this array is cleaned up, and then the actual pointer to it would be meaningless. So you'd have to use a special marking, marshalling mechanism to convert this string into a string literal. And then we just put s, do, you know, file, uh, we do terminal output on that, on that operand. So let's see what happens here. So we get back this, this, uh, the hash of the current commit. And we know this is actually happening at compile time and not runtime because we can examine the LLVM output. So this is the entire program. Print version is just a single call to put S and it passes a pointer to a string literal, right? Which is right here. And we see that all of the text has been concatenated into, into a single string literal at compile time. So there's no evidence of having to do any of this um, popen uh, or vector manipulation, or there's no sprintf. Everything is just this one, this one string literal. Uh, what happens if we have a runtime error? Or what happens if we have a uh, uh, an error trying to call git ref parse head? 
this would throw an exception and just kind of like the last example let's try to copy uh, let's try to copy the source code into a directory that's not in a git repo so now we're outside of a git repo what happens when you build it well we get a compile time error indicating fatal not a git repository this is the exact error we would get from running git outside of the repository um, Again, we have backtrace information. It tells us exactly which line of source, 27, the exception was thrown. So we have this very good integration of, of exception handling with uh, compile time errors. Let's go back into the directory now. OK, so. Since we can, we've already uh, shown how to open up files and how to use shell commands. Let's consider like taking to this ne next level, which is supporting JSON. Um, consider formatting your 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 source code into JSON files because JSON is machine and human readable. We could let a domain specialist uh, consume uh, content in JSON and emit content in JSON using any kind of tool, uh, uh, Python or MATLAB or Mathematic or, or anything imaginable. And then when it comes into our C++ part of the pipeline, we want to be able to load up this JSON and then emit new C++ binaries from it and do that in a way where there is no runtime dependency on that JSON. So all the all the all this uh, code generation is done entirely at compile time. And we and we don't want to really involve any additional programming work here. So consider a file called inject JSON. This is going to have two function definitions, square which is defined pretty obviously. If we just let the convention be that X is the first parameter of the function and unity, which is defined in terms of square. So it's, we could certainly say that the, uh, the square of sine plus the square of cosine equals one, right? So we're gonna emit this, this function and then we're gonna emit the this, this second function in terms of the first. So how do we do it? Well, we can just pound include JSON HPP, which is a pretty uh, well-known like 21,000 line header-only JSON parser, right? So all of this code, um, you can just, you can pull from GitHub and all of this can be used at compile time without any modification. I don't have to put const expr anywhere. I don't have to, you know, uh, condition in any way. I can just use it because I have a fully featured interpreter. So the first thing we're gonna do is open up that JSON file right here, inject.json using ifstream. So you pound include fstream, you make an ifstream object called uh, that opens up inject.json. You're going to initialize the JSON parser, which is the end loman is the namespace, which so is the JSON class. We're going to create a, an object called inject.json. And then we're going to pipe the file into the JSON object. Now, if this, again, if this, if there's a, a problem here, it'll throw an exception and then we'll get the formatted, um, we'll get the exception formatted as a compiler error if anything goes wrong. But if it doesn't, we're going to have a, a, a well initialized object here and continue moving on. And now we can enter a compile time for loop. And this is where circle becomes really powerful. Um, we can walk through, we can step through this data right here imperatively. And yet we haven't really created a new real scope. We're still in the global namespace in the body of the for loop. That means I can create both meta objects that hold um, data that have a storage duration that's equal to the compile time. But we can also create new functions in the global namespace. So even though this is in the body of a for loop, it's still a function declaration in the global namespace. So we're going to create functions for every item that are in return double. They're going to have a name that's going to be key right here is the string name of the of the JSON object. So it'll either be square or unity, right? Now at key is a dynamic name operator. So this yields an identifier from a string. So it'll, it'll yield, it'll take the string square and yield the identifier square. And this function will take one parameter called X. It's very important that's called X because we've chosen that convention here in the JSON file. Now all you have to do is return the JSON string value form, uh, uh, ingested as a C++ expression. So because this is running at compile time, the whole compiler process is already loaded into memory. So I have access to the, the tokenizer, the 
uh, C uh, preprocessor, that second tokenizer pass, and then the whole kind of semantic pipeline for C++. So this will take these expressions right here and here and turn it into C++ code and return that value. So just by putting a function declaration or definition in a for loop, you can mechanically generate code, right? So we get a, a nice compile time printf as a diagnostic. So it's, it says it's injecting these two these two functions, and now let's try to, to run it. So the main function is just going to call unity of 0.3. Of course, the argument shouldn't matter since it should be equal to one anyway. So we see that we just evaluated sine of the, the square of this uh, sine plus the square of the cosine. Can we you know verify that we've done that? Sure, because we can print out we can uh, print out the LLVM code. And we see that our unity function right here is just calling sine, it's squaring that right here. It's calling cosine, squaring that, and adding them together. And we have this well-optimized code that came straight out of JSON. So one question is, what do you do about modularity? Because in this, in this, in this example right here, um, we have some amount of logic and it's all printed out in line. If we break this, logic up into functions we've sort of lost the the interesting scoping aspects because we can't declare or define new functions instead of other functions uh, because inline function declarations even if they're allowed are not what we're intending here but circle does provide you with macros and these are not like c preprocessor macros they're special circle macros that look like functions they undergo name lookup overload resolution involve implicit conversion sequences just like any other function call but instead of establishing their own scope they're expanded into the calling scope so you can call or you can expand a circle macro into any curly brace scope and it would be like taking its contents evaluating and then pasting it into your scope so we've created a macro here that's going to inject a function from a string name and a string text since these are macros all the parameter of the arguments have to have values that are known at compile time. So this is a compile time string name and a compile time string of, of, of text of value of the, the definition for the function. So uh, this just prints out the name and the text of the function. This defines the function. What scope is it? De is it defining the function or declaring the function? We don't know yet because this is just a macro. It depends where the macro is expanded. So kind of moving outside into a, an outer layer of the onion here, consider injecting uh, from JSON, not just injecting from a name, right? So we're gonna take a file name, open that, that file, uh, ingest it into JSON, loop over all the objects, and then expand our inject function macro given this data. Again, we don't know where we're expanding the macro because it's just a macro. We have to know the, the ultimate um, uh, scope. So the, the real scope here is a new namespace. So in this, this syntax of the macro, we can say we're going to expand a macro called inject from JSON into the injected namespace. The injected namespace hasn't been declared yet, so let's define a namespace injected and then expand this macro. And this macro will go through two loop iterations in this case, because there's two objects, and expand this macro for each of the, the, the functions and then declare these two names in the injected namespace. And then we're going to call injected colon colon unity of 0.3 and and have a, a new program there we go so you can achieve modularity using circle macros so one thing that everyone wants to do is use reflection so circle has um, a lot of introspection and reflection capabilities for the for the introspection which is getting information about types primarily uh, there's like about 15 new keywords that are simple to use and will yield useful type information. So we have things like member count. How many public non-static data members are there in a class type? So if you take this intrinsic or this new uh, extension, feed it a type. It could be a templated type, which it usually is since we're, you know, we don't know what its type is because it's, it's dependent. This will, at, during instantiation, return the number of non-static data members. So we can loop over them and use this compile time loop iterator to get the type of the ith non-static data member, 
and print out its type name, get the name of the member itself, not the type name, but the name of the member here, and print that out. This just yields a string literal. And then get a like an L value of the actual member itself. So instead of providing this a type, we provided an object. And so this is a, a really compact way to print out the type, the member name, and the value of the member for any kind of object. So here we're just going to find a, a, a structure with three members, an int, a double, and a string. Initialize them, and then try to print out their objects. And we're going to print it out at compile time. All right, so we have uh, easy static introspection and reflection um, using using this big menagerie of keywords in conjunction with compile time control flow. Oops. This gets really good when we consider like uh, adding capabilities to support parameter packs. So parameter packs were introduced in C++ 11. Uh, you know, they use the dot, dot, dot syntax, but in standard C++, they're bound to template parameters or function template parameters. So there's always a, a template backing what you're, what you're dealing with. So Circle extends this by providing a whole bunch of uh, new keywords that yield unexpanded parameter packs that have nothing to do with templates. And uh, introspection keywords uh, fall into this class. So by using a pr pluralized version, instead of member type, if we use member types, this returns a parameter pack where each element of the pack is a type. So we can take this parameter pack, uh, pipe it through type name to get a, a pack of string name, string literals, uh, pipe those, you know, and, and push those through C out. And we can do the same thing with the member names, which is plural as well, and then member pack gives us uh, an L value to each of the public non-static data members. And C plus, uh, Circle extends C++ to allow pack expansion in any expression or sub-expression. So at the end of the expression in this expression statement, I can write dot, dot, dot to blow out all these packs and implicitly put commas between them. So if this is a, a three element parameter pack, you can imagine it being the, the first element, comma, second element, comma, third element, semicolon. So instead of having to write a loop, we can just use parameter packs, do all of our uh, manipulation, and then expand it at the end and, and put a terminating semicolon. All right, so we get the same output, and we've done that without even having to use a loop. So we can use uh, introspection keywords that return packs and expand the pack, and we have very powerful uh, introspection capability. So uh, consider doing type transformations uh, with, with introspection. So we're going to define a struct here, the same, same struct with three, three elements, and consider trying to create derivative types that instead of just having an int and a double and a stood string, have pointers to these or vectors of these. So we're just going to make a normal um, class template right here, structive pointers, there's a class template, and we're going to have a compile time loop that's going to loop over all the members in the argument type. Now we, inside this, this uh, child statement of the for loop, we're still in the same scope that we were before. This introduces, well, we introduce a new scope, but it's a meta scope, it's not a real scope. So you consider what the innermost enclosing real scope is, it's still the structure definition. That means that anything that looks like a declaration is a member specifier. So how do we parse a member specifier? We look at this sort of decal specifier sequence, which is just a base type. It can be like a, a simple type or a decal type or um, an alias. Uh, or some you know combinations of keywords like friend and and um, inline uh, extern etc. Uh, and now we have the declarator, which is some number of pre declarations like star ampersand double ampersand uh, a name and then some number of post -dec uh, declarations like uh, square brackets and uh, and and parentheses for declaring functions. So this is a full declaration here that uses introspection to get the type uh, and introspection to get the name. And since this now returns a string literal, I can put that string literal through the dynamic name operator to yield an identifier. So this will generate um, int star, int star, 
x, right? Uh, double star y and string star z. And what about struct to vectors, right? So here we're going to have a, a std vector specialized over the member type. So this creates vector of int x, vector of double y, and vector of string z. So let's let's try building this and using print type, which is not going to print the values of the object, but just their just their types. Understand we've affected this kind of um, struct to structive array and array of struct transformation correctly. There we go. So as described, uh, the foo t the foo two t type is uh, has pointers to the original types, and foo three t has vectors of the original type. Uh, the other thing we can do with parameter packs is perform really compact horizontal operations by employing fold operators. Fold operators were introduced in C++ 17. Uh, they haven't received much use because there's not that many interesting things in C++ that return parameter packs. But because Circle has so many parameter pack yielding intrinsics, we can now use these to, to save us some, some actual time. So consider a structure called Futi that has these four members. So we're going to create an instance and initialize it. Uh, use the member pack to yield and kind of a heterogeneous uh, pack of non-type L values to, to each of these members. So it'll be an L value of int, L value double, L value float, L value short. And then use a, a unary fold. So this will end up adding these four different components together horizontally uh, in a single line without any kind of loops. And this is like nice declarative programming that doesn't involve uh, any temporary accumulator or anything else and, and just works, including in a, in a dependent context. So 14 is the sum horizontally of these, of these four members. So We've looked at some introspection on class types. Consider introspection on enums, which I think are uh, kind of the unsung heroes of uh, Circle. They're really useful. Um, consider making a enum to string and string to enum function. So we're given uh, an enumeration. We want to get its the string name of its corresponding enumerator. How do we do that? Well, let's make a function template that takes an enum make a switch, we're going to switch over the value of that enum, and then make a uh, compile time for loop right there in the curly braces of the switch. So we're going to step through each of the enumerators. So we have this for enum, it's a special syntax, it's a for enum statement that will visit each of the four enumerators in this enum and fill E2 with a compile time known value. You can use this compile time known value as a case statement argument. So whenever E matches E2, which is one of these four guys, it's going to enter this case and here return the string name of this enumerator. So it will return the string circle, string square, string triangle, or string hexagon. If it doesn't match any of these, it will return a null pointer, which is fine. Going the other direction, we can't use a switch because we have to do string comparisons. But we're going to emit instead, using uh, metaphorinum, a sequence of string compare functions. So we're going to compare the ith string literal of the, of the, the string literal of the ith name with the provided name. So if this compares equal, then the return the result object is zero. In that case, we were going to enter and re return this enumerator. So we can go both directions using uh, function templates that had their contents generated by meta control flow. So now let's do a quick test. So we're going to uh, create an array of shape T enums, and we're going to kind of coerce six, which doesn't correspond to any of these enums in there. So this should print out unknown because uh, it'll return a null pointer string here, and we're going to see that null pointer string and print unknown. And going the other direction, we're going to declare square, triangle, and rhombus, but rhombus is not one of the recognized enums. So we expect that to print unknown as well because this uh, will return an uninitialized, or rather an empty optional. So uh, let's consider now using uh, the lessons about 
class type introspection and enumeration introspection to make a full feature object serializer. So you take a, any object and you want to generate a function template that will stream out its contents as if it were a JSON or some, some other desirable format. So to do that, make a function template called stream. It will take an OStream object, which could be a file handle or it could just be C out, uh, a reference to the object of that type. And then because we're doing this recursively, we're going to have to have like an indent counter. So indent just tells us how many pairs of characters to indent on, on each level so that we can like show its hierarchical or recursive nature. So first thing to do is use a chain on the outside rather is to use a chain of if const expert commands to figure out which of these branches are relevant for this this object we're printing out. So if the object is an enum, this is using type traits from C++ to test for scalar, uh, to test for if something's a scalar or if it's an enum or if it's a, a class type or union or, or what have you. So if it's an enum, we're going to call enum to name, which is this function we just developed in the previous example, enum to name. If that returns us a string letter, we're going to print it out. Otherwise, we're going to print out the object value as an integer. Uh, here we're just coercing it to its underlying type. In case you have a scoped enum, C out won't want to print out a, a scoped enum as an integer, but it will print out uh, the its underlying type as an integer. Uh, if we have an instance of a class template, well, we're going to, uh, I'm sorry, if we have a, an instance of the basic string template, so any, like std string or basic string over uh, wide character or 32-bit character, we want to print that object out inside quotes. If there's an instance of std vector, we want to print it out in square brackets. So first we print the square bracket. Then we make a runtime loop, because we don't know how many elements this vector has a runtime loop over its contents, and then recursively print out each of the, the members here. So X is each of the successive members that we're going to recursively print out X, and also like print out commas to separate them right here. Uh, if we have an instance of std map, do the same thing, but now print out key value pairs. So X is a pair of keys and value. X dot first is the key, which we recurse and print. X dot second is the value, which we recurse and print. Uh, we separate with commas. Uh, if we have an instance of std optional, we can do that as well. So if if the op if the optional is actually set, then we can recurse on star obj, which will no longer be a std optional, but will be an L value to whatever that thing held, uh, or else just print null because null is like a perfectly valid optional value. Um, if we have a class type, um, we're going to want to now use circles member introspection to break this class apart. So we're going to visit all the non-static public data members here, um, print out the name of the member, recurse on its value, and print out commas to separate these. At the same time, we're always indenting so we can kind of understand the underlying format of it. And then if there's like anything left over, we're just going to try to, to print that out. So this would be any non-class type that wasn't caught from one of the above cases. Uh, if something's ultimately not supported by um, by IO streams, we're going to get a compile time error, which is the best we can possibly hope for. So here I'm def uh, defining a, a pretty complicated structure. So there's a vec3 here. There's a map where the key is a string and the value is a vec3. There's a, a, a scope denum of robot names. And then there's this structure that kind of brings all these things together. So this is a, a difficult structure to, to serialize if you don't have static reflection. All right, so here I'm just going to initialize all this and then call stream. All right, so by calling stream, I'm passing it the reference to, to C out. We're going to um, stream everything straight to the terminal. At the end, we're just going to print out a new line. Great, so we can see we have all the values of this structure serialized gives us the name, colon, the member type, and then finally the member value. So uh, S is the, the name of the member, it's a std string, and it has a value, struct one T instance. This is in quotes because it matched this case right here, which streamed out in quotes. Um, we match std vector and print out its contents in braces. 
uh, rather square brackets uh, right here. So here we print out the square brackets and then recurse on its members. Same thing with the vector. This is done as a, a curly braces because we print out a class object. Uh, this is uh, printing out the enumerator names given an enumeration. We have a, a vector right here and we can see we've recursively print out the keys and the value. So the keys called X, Y, and Z, the values are VEC3 and the values are recursively other classes. So we're able to get a JSON-like format uh, with just, you know, less than 100 lines of code, really, right here, for pretty much any type, and it's, it's easily extensible. I guess it's the end of those. Um, what else do we have in here? Oh, yes. So, given all this metaprogramming flexibility, what can we do with basic uh, C++ utility data types, like tuples? Tuples are a very complicated type to define in C++11 and in C++20. Um, but in, in Circle, it's really easy because you can create a single class template that has a flat data structure. Write a compile time loop over each of the parameter pack elements and emit a data member for each of those elements. So here's, here's our tuple definition. It's, there's only two lines in the definition. It has a compile time meta for loop that I'm going to step over all of the members in the pack. Use the new dot 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 square bracket uh, pack subscripting syntax. So types T is a pack, and now I'm going to sub uh, a type pack. I'm going to subscript the type pack just to get a type out, and then use the dynamic name operator to convert an integer to an identifier. So uh, at of zero is going to yield the identifier underscore zero because zero itself is not a valid identifier, but underscore zero is. Uh, you know at of two is gonna generate the identifier underscore two. So by instantiating this over uh, int, std, string, and double, I'm gonna create a tuple with these three types and the member names are underscore zero, underscore one, and underscore two respectively uh, without having to do any kind of um, recursion or use um, uh, base class hierarchies like the, the standard implementation does or having to use uh, you know, parameter pack expansion in the in the in the base classes, and then again we can use this old uh, print object one-liner that uses parameter pack expansion here as well. So this makes uh, programming metaprogramming very easy. So we get the contents of this tuple that we've just declared or defined in two lines here, and we've printed its um, contents out in just a single statement. Uh, this is a considerably more difficult example to pull off in C++. Uh, consider taking a tuple over a list of types and creating a unique list of those types and creating the tuple from that. So um, I have this list right here. It's an int, double, pointer to character, double, pointer to character, and float. How do I just get the unique list? That's stable, too. Um, so I just want to instantiate a tuple over int, double, pointer to character. We already have a double. We already have a pointer to character and a float. So one, two, three, four elements. So how do we turn these six elements with two redundancies into four unique type, uh, uh, four unique types? Uh, in C++ template metaprogramming, you can probably write some kind of bitonic sort, which is really all the language gives you. It's very hard to manipulate types like values, but circle gives you really useful mechanism for doing that. So consider just creating a new sort routine. Now this is, there's nothing compile time about this. It's a normal function called stable unique. It's going to take a std vector, create a, 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 a fresh vector, and then for every element in the input, it's going to search the uh, output vector for that element. If it's not already there, meaning it comp uh, it's it finds end, then I'm going to push this new element into the output element. So in this way, I'm going to take in left to right order, take the first element from the output, see if it's in the, take the first element from the input, see if it's in the output, and if it's not, I'll push it in there and do that for all the elements of the input. Uh, this is unlike using std sort and 
just did unique, this is stable. Uh, and then I'll just um, move this new element into the old old array. So this, this takes a, a, a L value reference as opposed to returning something. Now, what's cool is that circle has a M type, which is a new built-in type, 64 bits, the size of a, a pointer, that itself holds an opaque pointer to a type in the compiler's abstract syntax tree. So I can coerce a static type, which is the argument here, types T, right? So it's each of these members of the parameter pack into an eight byte variable type using dynamic type. So dynamic type over a type returns a value and that value contains a pointer to that actual type in the compiler's type system. This is only available at compile time. So these statements necessarily have to be prefixed by meta. Now, what's cool, I can sort these M types because I've provided uh, comparison operators for them. So less than, less than or equal, you know, greater, greater, they're equal, 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 and not equal. Those six uh, relational and comparison operators are all um, implemented so that I can use functions like std sort and I can use functions like std find. So now I can create a unique set of M types right here with these two functions. So the first one just uh, you know, initializes a vector. This little vector will be initialized with, with uh, six members. After going through stable unique, it'll be cut down to four members. Now I need to get the types back out of the M type. So I can use pack type, which I provided a std vector that's known at compile time, and it'll, it'll yield me an unexpanded parameter pack with the types inside of those M types. Now this is maybe a little tricky, but uh, this is only a this is a single line operation as opposed to like God knows how many if you were to use template metaprogramming. So this will undo the dynamic type operator. Dynamic type takes um, a type and packs packages it into a or boxes it into an M type. The static type keyword and the pack type keywords unbox that M type. They get the opaque pointer, resolve it with the actual type that's managed by the compiler, and yield that type for you. So I can take that type and uh, and unpack it, and then run it through type name to get a string literal for it. So here, this is a diagnostic, just telling me what I'm doing, right? And here's the actual operation to create a tuple. So I'm going to create a new tuple defined as uh, above. It's just that our standard two-line tuple here, and I'm going to instantiate it over a parameter pack that I've unpacked from this sorted array, from this, this unique array, and, and expand that. So this is now gonna take these six elements and create a new tuple over just the four unique elements. So we should be able to see the diagnostic now from this meta, meta C out statement, right? So we, have, we see the four unique elements from these six nine unique template arguments. All right, so a, uh, another really great extension is enum type name. So these are, these are, are typed enums, and uh, this is kind of similar to the um, type lists that were introduced kind of in like 2003 with the modern C++ design book, where you could define, uh, define class templates that just had a single type def head, and then they had a type def tail that referenced another uh, instantiation of, of the same class template. And by doing this, you could kind of provide, define a conceptual linked list where every node had a single type definition or, or, or alias. The downside was that it was super hard to, to work with and you had to use template metaprogramming to do any kind of operation, including, uh, you know, getting the union of lists, splitting lists, sorting lists, um, and extracting the types from list was like really difficult. But now there's a uh, new enum type name where it's a normal enum so that it has an implicit underlying type if you don't provide one. Uh, every enum has an optional name. They have values that are implicitly uh, assigned, you know, starting with zero, zero, one, two, three, et cetera. But they, they have mandatory associated types. So the Enum called capital int has an associated type of int. The enum capital double, double, double has an associated type double and so on. The, you know, the, the enum 
enumerator array has an associated type float4. I can use introspection to access the associated type for any enum. Uh, and since I can dynamically define enums by having like meta for loops, I can do very simple operations to, to join their contents, to sort their contents, or, or anything else using this kind of imperative metaprogramming. So uh, consider defining a tuple that uh, has these. Uh, we're going we're gonna to instantiate this new tuple over this type list so that the new tuple is not going to take a parameter pack anymore. It's going to just cr take a single type argument. That type, type argument has to be a type denim. So if it's not a type denim, it'll fail the static assert. Now I'm going to run a metaphor over the enum. So I'm going to visit each of its five enumerators. So these enumerators are going to be filled with int, double, string, array, and int2. And then I can get out the associated type. Because this enum is known at compile time, I can pull out its compile time associated type. So on iteration 0, this will yield int. On iteration 1, it'll yield double. Iteration 2, it'll yield std string, and so on. And what I've just done is reinvented the struct, but now as a tuple. So uh, uh, let's, let's try printing this object. So what I've what I've just done is created a tuple that is create uh, generated from a type denum, and it looks like writing a struct by hand. It's it's as if you were to write a struct, you know, struct s, where the first element is an int called int, right? The next element is a double called double, a std string called string, oops, and so on. So what's the point of of doing this? Well. For a tuple, it doesn't really add any value, but this lets us build uh, complex data structures that are difficult to express otherwise, namely the variant. Uh, variant is one of the most complicated data structures in C++. If we just want to look at the um, source code, uh, C++ 9, I believe, or 9. Uh, the variant header is profoundly complicated because standard C++ doesn't give you uh, an ability to make a flat data structure inside inside a union. Um, however, with circle, you can specialize a variant over a type denim, right? Uh, use an instance of this type denim to hold the tag indicating what's the active kind, of, uh, the active variant member. Open a new anonymous union inside the anonymous unions definition, loop through each of the enumerators, right? And then instantiate a variant member from the, from the associated type for each of the uh, uh, typed enums. So here we're going to instantiate this variant over uh, a typed enum with types int, double, and const character pointer. And they're going to have enumerator names i, d, and s. And we want to use these as the tag names so that we can uh, uh, manipulate the variant as if it were a normal, normal type. So even though it's a generic, generic data structure, we're going to uh, let it carry over our chosen member, member names, which makes using it a lot easier. Uh, the alternative is having to use you know, std get with 4 or 7 or some index indicating the um, ordinal position of the variant member within the anonymous union. We don't have to do that with uh, type denims. So uh, how do we create this variant? Um, or access this variant, let's consider writing a visitor. So we're going to have a visitor here, which is just a, um, a lambda function. This one has no uh, closure, so it's just going to decay to a regular uh, function pointer. But really, it's a, uh, a generic lambda. So this is more like a function template, where the template argument, or the template parameter is itself, a, um, or rather, the function parameter is a template parameter. So we want to have this function called uh, on the appropriate variant member, on the active variant member. So we're going to instantiate a variant over these three member types, set its tag to, to D, indicating double, and then access var.d, which is, which is just naming one of the variant members, setting that to pi, and then calling visit. So var.visit now is going to uh, open a switch on the active variant kind 
And then the body of the switch is going to just loop over all of the, the possibilities. And if we're in the active one, it's going to invoke our, uh, our, our visitor pattern, our, our, our Lambda function. And what do we invoke? Well, we get the name of the uh, variant member out. So this is the, the name of the enumerator. So it's I, D, or S as a string literal. Pass that string literal through the dynamic name operator to produce an identifier. And then ordinary name lookup rules apply. It'll perform name lookup for I, D, or S. It'll find I, D, or S in the uh, anonymous union. So it'll pass an L value of that to the visitor. And then that function call will instantiate this generic lambda over int, double, or pointer to const character and allow us to print out the, the name of the type being int, double, or const character pointer and its value. So this is a whole bunch of variant plumbing without any pain because we can use, um, we can define it as a flat data structure, use a, a compile time loop to uh, generate each of the variant members and then use compile time loops for visitors, for um, the constructors, destructors, conversion operators, for everything else to define the, the operations of that variant. And we also get uh, to be able to use our own tag names. Like you can, you can give, if you choose to, you can give these the names that, that you'd prefer. If you omit the name, it'll be assigned a name underscore zero underscore one, which is still a fantastic uh, member name for a variant or for a tuple. So let's let's try using this. So the visitor initially prints out the double case, and then <clears throat> we set the active type to string, and call it again, and it prints out the string. So you can use the uh, imperative metaprogramming components of Circle along with its compile time execution of anything, of access to the full host environment, to implement uh, type providers, which is a feature provided in, C, in F sharp, but not in C sharp, oddly, um, which allows you to bind to a, a data source's schema at compile time and generate bindings that you can use at runtime. Uh, so this that's you know good for for binding to JSON files or probably things more complicated like um, like SQL database handles. So you can use uh, uh, your SQL um, assets without having to go through the whole um, uh, you know SQL command submission process every time. You can use the database more like a regular object. So uh, you know I, I wrote a, a, a simple example of type providers in Circle. That just bind to a comma, comma separated value, uh, which has a simple schema that you can infer uh, at compile time by looking for uh, an example file in your source directory. So let's look at a, a, the sample schema. Uh, this is a one line characteristic CSV file. So this is a, a CSV of earthquakes. So the first line in a CSV is typically uh, the the name of the fields or the, the list of field names. So we have a date and time field, latitude field, longitude field, etc. This goes to the end of the line. And then all the subsequent lines are data. And there's no explicit schema in CSV. So we're going to have to infer uh, the schema from the kinds of data we find in the fields. So at compile time, we're gonna we're gonna open up this this file here that's in our source directory and it's characteristic of what we expect to find in the wild when we actually deploy the program. And the the first field is date and time, but it's just a string because it doesn't really parse as a double. Uh, for our purposes, we're only supporting two data types, which are strings and doubles. And doubles will will support all all numeric formats. Uh, the latitude and longitude both parse like doubles, meaning that their entire field, all characters in their field will, will parse as a double. Uh, you know, the depth, magnitude, etc., parses, doubles. And then a lot of these, like for instance, these are these are empty. We don't have any information on, on these, so we just treat them as string, which is their kind of fallback. So what's nice is that we get um, fields that we expect to appear like doubles, promoted to doubles, and then we can use them as if they're actual arithmetic types. Um, and we're gonna generate uh, a, a structure representing a whole record at compile time without any 
you know input from the user. It's just gonna it's gonna scrape the the, the contents of this of this uh, schema or this example CSV file. So let's look at the type provider source code. <clears throat> uh, and so ordinary C++ headers, right? We're gonna write our own CSV loader because it's it's so easy to do. Um, so consider defining a struct called type info, and this is going to have an um, you know a member struct field t, which just has a, a, the type of the field as a string and the name of the field as a string. So we want the names to be populated from this top row in the in the schema. We want the the field types to be populated by inferring their type from the actual data format. So this would be type double in quotes. And this would be the the date and time would be type string. So we're going to write a normal C++ function to to read uh, the schema from an I stream. So this just reads like the the first uh, first row and optionally the first data row as well. Uh, and um, so I I'm going to here's the actual kind of parsing to separate the fields out from their uh, comma separators, and I'm going to push the um, the name of each field into into this array, right? And then I'm gonna uh, pa uh, after reading the first row, I'm gonna, I'm gonna read the first data row, which is the second row in, in the file. And uh, after separating the fields out, I'm gonna run them through scanf of uh, lf, which is the the escape code for double precision value, and I'm gonna check that. Uh, scanf was able to convert all of the characters in the field to a double. If it was, then I'm going to say, well, that field itself is numeric, and I'm going to represent it as a double type. Otherwise, it's a string type. So I do this for, for um, all the fields in the first row at compile time. And then I want to use this information to basically stamp out a new type. So whenever you compile the the um, this translation unit, it's going to open this sample CSV file. It's going to scan in the um, the first row, which has the the names of the field, and the second row, which has uh, information about the expected data types. And it's going to lower that to a struct definition. And how do we do that? Well, consider this macro right here: define type. So after calling reads uh, CSV schema at compile time, we're going to get a compile time type info t which is an instance of this collection of fields. And then I'm going to pass this along with a struct name to the define type macro. And the define type macro is wherever it's expanded is going to generate a, a new struct and it's going to give it this name. So define type over S is our foo is going to create a struct called foo, right? Uh, with these, with this type information. So in the struct definition, I'm just going to loop over all the fields here with a, a range base four. And then convert the string name of or the string type, like the string double or the string stood string, to the equivalent type, and use this as the type of the member specifier. And then I also have the the name of the field to use as the data member name. So uh, this is a way to um, open up files at compile time, uh, generate types at compile time and use those then to that type to specialize function templates to generate functionality. Um, you can see I, I can do that here. I can actually verify my schema at, at runtime based on uh, the, the type that I've just created. So I have to make sure that the schema that I, like when I, when I open a, a CSV file at runtime, I want to get its schema out and then compare that to the schema that's kind of baked into this, into this static type. And then I want to do the same thing when I read a CSV line. So I have type information that I've put into my type that I can, I can extract with uh, the introspection keywords, right? Member count, member name, um, <clears throat> and uh, member type. This will either be double or string. Uh, and be able to um, automatically convert the CSV I have at runtime to a type that I've chosen at compile time based on the best available information I had, you know, uh, uh, when building. So uh, let's take a look at what, what really goes on here. Um, in the main function, this is how you use it. So everything above here is like library code, and it's, it's very generic. So in our main function, I'm going to define a new type called object type t, right? And this, since this Mac was expanded in main, 
this structure is going to be defined in the main function. And I'm going to point it at schema.csv. So define CSV type is a macro right here. So it's going to take the name and the file name, and then it's going to call read CSV schema from this file name. And so read CS CSV schema here is just a normal function, but remember I'm calling it inside a macro argument, so it's necessarily um, evaluated at compile time, right? This will return the type info t. The type info t will be passed to define type right here, which creates our, our new type. So that's the first line. That's, that's all done in one line of client code right here. And then as a diagnostic, I just want to print out the, the contents of this type or the, the, the structure of the type. So I'm going to print out uh, the names of all the member types and the member type names themselves, or the member names themselves. And then um, at runtime, so there's no meta here. So you know it's going to run at um, compile time when there's a meta in front of it. And in this case, if a macro expansion, that macro recursively has like a, a meta declaration in that, it'll run at compile time. But this part's run at runtime. So we're going to load a different file. Here it's just one line of data. And here it's, you know, thousands of lines of data. So it's an earthquake database file. So load this up at runtime. And what's different now is when we're loading it, we actually know what the what the um, the type we're expecting is. It's object type T, which we created here. So we created this type given our schema information we loaded at compile time. And now we can we can um, use this as a contract. It's an expectation of what this what this file is going to contain. So I'm going to I'm going to open the CSV file right and read it in. So here we're going to open the file. Uh, read the, the schema, which in this case is just the first line, which has the member names, compare them to the names of the um, data members in our type. So we're loading out the, uh, we're parsing out the, the member names from the file, calling verify schema right here, which just loops over the fields, and then it checks the member names. So the member names are, are, are the same. So the field name in the file must match the member name, or else we have a problem. And we're, then we just throw an exception, saying that the, um, you know, the field is the wrong name. And then we continue parsing, right? So for every while we can get a line, we grab a line and we call read CSV line, which again, kind of similar to, to the, to the um, compile time case. The runtime case just reads a line. Uh, you know, it consumes a, a comma if it expects one in front of a field. And then if it's a double, it parses as a double using scanf. Otherwise, it just copies the text of the field as a string, and it continues on until it runs out of lines. Uh, what's neat here is that we can use um, the CSV's data like normal data structs now. They're just they're normal structs. So this read CSV file is going to return a std vector of this type. And I probably should have written that out instead of using audio. It's std vector of object type T. So then like for, um, for our test, we're just going to print out 10 elements um, and print out their latitude and longitude. So we find 10 random elements, access them, and get their latitude and longitude as doubles, because these are actually type double, right? And, um, and, and print them out. If the CSV doesn't have a, a latitude or longitude field, this would give us a compile time error, because uh, this member would not exist. This member, this is a, you know, we're naming a data member. This member only exists because in the schema loaded at compile time, there are CSV fields named latitude and longitude. And if that fails, if that expectation fails, we're going to compile time error, which is much better than a, a runtime error. However, if the schema has latitude and longitude and the file at runtime doesn't, we're going to get a runtime error, which is, again, the best you can do. So either, either way, we're pretty covered there. Um, so we can either use, uh, these members by name, if we have some expectation of what the data is going to hold, or we can do it generically. So in, so the first case, we're going to print out 10 uh, random members. And we're going to show their latitude and longitude. In the second case, we're going to print out all the fields from a random record. So here we're just going to load any random record and then um, you know loop over, or not loop over, but do a parameter pack expansion over its names and its uh, members. So to build this guy, we're going to build type provider.cxx. Now we've, we've uh, it's going to sh show this, uh, this line right here is our diagnostic. It's showing out all the, uh, the types of all the members and the names of all the members. So we're going to get a std string date time, a double latitude, double longitude, double depth, double magnitude, std string mag type, etc. So we've just taken a CSV, which has no 
explicit type information in it, and we've inferred its schema from the kinds of contents we found at compile time. So we got that. Now we, let's try to run type provider. And when we run it, it's going to load this earthquake CSV file, convert all the fields to either std string or double respectively, and then print out the latitude and longitude from 10 members by using the latitude and longitude member names, and then choose some, some 11th random record and print out all of its contents using a metaphor loop, or in this case, a, a parameter pack expansion over uh, the member names and the member pack. All right, so here are 10 random records. And we can print out the um, latitude and longitude as doubles, and we could do, you know, we could manipulate them arithmetically if we wanted, because they're they're strongly typed and they they have that type information that we generated algorithmically. And then for the eleventh record, we're just going to print out all of its members. The final topic in this walkthrough is embedded domain-specific languages. Uh, DSLs have been practiced in C++ for almost 20 years, uh, mostly in the context of performing linear algebra. You could, uh, you know, write overloaded operators for, um, for instance, for addition, and then perform component-wise addition, and, and elide having to create a bunch of uh, temporary objects. Um, I try to avoid any sort of operator overloading or any sort of template metaprogramming when, when practicing um, domain-specific languages in Circle, and instead just allowing uh, the user to type in a string, or a string literal, really, in, in most cases, and uh, run that through a tokenizer and parser of your own devising, um, taking an intermediate output and then lowering that to AST using a uh, mix of um, you know meta, meta uh, statements and macros, circle macros. So uh, a really cool introduction to this is the <clears throat> eprintf function. Uh, this is the same as Python f strings. Um, it's like printf except for you embed the expression you want to evaluate directly into the format specifier. So the, the syntax looks like this. So we're going to call eprintf on a string literal, and we're going to embed expressions inside curly braces. So um, x inside braces will evaluate x in the scope of the printf statement itself, a printf expression. Uh, so this will say x equal 5, and this will say square root equals the square root of x, and this will say exp equals you know this expression um, evaluated. So this cannot be a normal function because an ordinary function would establish a new scope for, um, and then any uh, name lookup would only be able to find uh, symbols in parent scopes, which would be things like um, classes if it's a, a member function or a uh, namespace. But it would be impossible normally to have to call into some library function and access these, these names. And even if you could do that, uh, standard C++ doesn't give you the ability to process text in this way. So you'd have to be able to take um, strings that are known at compile time and then reprocess them to extract these expressions and somehow evaluate it. Uh, it's nice that in circle this becomes super easy. So what we do is we define an eprintf as an expression macro. Expression macro starts with the macro token and then it returns type auto. What this means is that it uh, establishes a new, a new uh, meta scope so meta objects can be declared, and they'll these objects will be destructed when when the closing uh, curly brace is encountered. However, uh, it does not create a new real scope. So any real statement will kind of like fall, or real expression will fall through to the innermost and closing real scope. Um, the 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 restriction about expression macros in particular is that you're only allowed to have one real statement. It has to be uh, return statement. So you can have, we can have multiple return statements, but only one can be hit given the meta control flow. So in this case, um, what we're going to do is allocate compi a compile time array of strings, vector of strings, and this will hold each of these uh, braced expressions that we want to evaluate. Uh, we're going to include a, a compile time std string, which is going to have a, uh, <clears throat> a reformatted uh, printf format specifier. So what we're going to do is call transform format. This is a normal function, but we're going to call it a compile time. And that's going to uh, locate these brace pairs, strip out the 
uh, contents, the text inside the braces, push that into this expressions um, object, this vector, and then replace the whole brace with a percentage sign s, which is the ordinary C printf format specifier to escape a string. And we can just then forward, um, we can forward this call to normal printf. So the the um, parsing code, we just have like a kind of a tokenizer that scans to the closing brace here, and then we have this transform format which does most of the work, right? So it it uh, loops over every character. If it's a, a open curly brace, then we scan to the closing curly brace and we strip out the uh, the text inside the braces, push that into the expressions array, and we push into our uh, output text percentage s to escape. Um, we also have an, uh, we can escape a, a left brace just by using percentage left brace, and that will just be replaced with left brace in the format specifier. Otherwise, we just pass the text through uh, unchanged, right? So that's a normal function, but we're going to call it at compile time because we have a meta statement, uh, a meta token on this uh, expression statement. Now, how to evaluate this really unusual unhygienic printf. It's unhygienic, but it's super useful and it's a good gateway to doing more complicated uh, DSL work. Well, we're going to do a big pack expansion. So the, the printf is going to take as its first argument the format specifier. So we're taking this uh, modified format specifier where we just replace these with percentage s and then using the string uh, extension, which you saw in the uh, git hash um, example, this is going to convert this string that's known at compile time to a string literal. So this is the format specifier as a string literal now, uh, or as a, a constant array technically. And then we're going to um, try to convert each of these expressions to strings um, and then expand them into multiple arguments. Because we're going to have to provide one argument for each escaped, uh, uh, for, for each escapement in the, in the printf format specifier. So uh, in this example, <clears throat> this is going to be a length three vector. Uh, you know, holding text of x, text of square root of x, and text of exp of x. So the first thing we're going to do is uh, convert this three vector into a unexpanded parameter pack. So we can call, since the size of the vector is known at compile time, it's safe to do this. We don't know, how, we don't know what the, we don't have to know what the values are at compile time, but we have to know what the, um, what the size of this vector is at compile time, right? So if we call pack non-type on this vector, this yields an unexpanded parameter pack with three members, which are each of the three array elements. We can then pipe that through the expression extension, which was used in the JSON example to create new functions from text. So this will create, or create new expressions from text. This will evaluate an expression from text. So this will evaluate the expression x, it'll evaluate the expression square root of x, it'll evaluate the expression exp of x. Then we have to use std string to convert that expression from, in this case, a double to a std string. So we can do that. And this is like a pretty limited function. So it only works for some kind of simple built-in types. So we, we could extend this to work with really any type since we have reflection. And then finally, we're going to get its um, pointer to the uh, internal null terminated string. So this whole thing right here will yield us a, a parameter pack not of um, text that refers to the function or the expression to be evaluated, but the actual uh, uh, string itself, right? And then we're going to do a, a pack expansion. So this is going to expand up to three additional arguments in addition to this uh, uh, the format specifier. So let's build this guy. All right, we see that um, again. These, the 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 transformation from this format specifier to a printf format specifier is done at compile time. But the values themselves can be can be anything. They're, they're ordinary runtime values. Um, this solves a lot of long-standing and kind of unresolved issues with with printf, which is really everyone's choice of um, of doing I/O or doing you know terminal I/O because it's it's concise and compact. But it's not type safe, um, and there's it requires that you uh, coordinate your escapes on the left hand side with your arguments on the right hand side. And here, it's just you know one one thing of text. So if we want to kind of go to the next level on this, we could look at the RPN uh, domain specific language. This is reverse pulse notation. It's a 
um, a postfix notation where you put uh, operands on the left hand side so you like push them to a stack as soon as you get an operand you push it to a stack and then when you encounter an op an operator uh, you pop out one or two elements from the stack you combine them and you push it back onto the stack and this is the way like calculators from the 1970s worked uh, it's not used in modern computing but what's nice about it is that the grammar is so simple we can write our own parser with really like very little effort so um, the tokens the operators I'm going to recognize are the four basic operators um, some trigonometric unary operators and two uh, you know basic function elementary function binary functions atan2 and, and, and pow so uh, consider providing a specifying a, um, a the format specifier here it's it's just an rpn expression right and these uh, identifiers refer to local variables so this z in the string refers to the Z as an argument. We could do that because we can evaluate expressions um, from inside of macros. Because the macro is going to be expanded into the calling scope. So obviously RPN eval has to be a macro because we don't want to let it establish its own scope and hide the X, Y, and Z object. So we see that it is an it's um, uh, expression macro right here and it has a single return statement. And so this return statement is going to be Kind of constructed and then detached, and it's going to replace the thing we've just we just um, we've just called right here. So, uh, what happens is that you generate a function that's uh, parameterized with RPN notation, but actually compiles down to ordinary infix C++ code. So, how does this work? So, we enter this macro where we call RPN parse on our text. This text has to be known at compile time. It doesn't have to be a string literal, but it has to be known at compile time. So the parse code right here uh, just converts this text into a, like an abstract syntax tree. So we have a we have a node format right here. The node can be there's like you know several kinds. There's um, uh, variables which are just you know like string literal identifiers that don't match other operators. There are the arithmetic operators, and there are unary and binary functions. So these are the tokens for those. All right. So the first thing we're going to do here is um, parse this into an AS tree. So we, we get our input text. We initialize um, a stack of uh, AST pointers. And so we, we whenever we encounter an element, we're going to push that element to the stack. And then when we encounter an operator, we're going to pop as many elements as we needed, combine them, and push them back down. By combining in an interpreter, you do the actual arithmetic operations, but combining in this parser means we're going to create a new AST node that's going to uh, kind of memoize the operation we have to do later. So it's really a, a two-step thing. We're building not an interpreter, we're building a compiler that's embedded in a circle translation unit. And we're actually defining the parser itself in your translation unit. So if the uh, we first like match what kind of token it is, and we have a switch. So if it's a variable, we just push that, we push that um, that token directly to the stack. If it's a unary operator, we have to pop the first element from the stack, right? Create a new node, and then um, push push that 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 node. So here we're, we're popping the first element and we're affixing that as the 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 left hand child of this node, right? So in all cases, we're creating a new a new node here. It's getting the left hand child, which was the thing on the top of the stack. For a binary operator or a binary function. We're going to pop two elements from the stack and set those as the left and right hand side children of this new node, right? And then we're going to push the node. So normally you'd be doing the operations, you wouldn't be pushing nodes, you'd be pushing values. But here we don't want to build an interpreter, we want to build a compiler. So when we're done, we can just return a, this, we should only have one node left. If it's not one node left, we'd throw an exception. And then, you know, the compiler would be able to print that out as a, a compiler error. Uh, so if we just have one node left, we're going to return that top element, and that's going to be the root for a new uh, binary tree describing an expression, and we can descend that and then emit something in infix notation, which is the, the standard for all mathematical um, expressions and for all programming languages now. So how do, we, how do we emit our expression? Well, just use another expression macro. So again, we have a, we have another macro here that does the eva evaluation. So we have the first macro and it just called the, the parser uh, and then it forwarded into eval node. And here's the actual implementation for eval node. So this is starts off being given the root of 
the root node of our of our tree. If that's an expression node, we're going to evaluate the text indicating the variable, right? So this is going to be uh, some variable name like x, y, or z, and this will evaluate that expression. Now we hope this, well, we ex we expect this name lookup to succeed because this is all being expanded inside the calling scope, and the calling scope in this case is my function where these arguments are visible. Uh, if it's an operator, we're going to uh, call, we're going to use the at op extension, which you can provide a, uh, a string for the operator you want to use. Like in this case, it'd be, you know, plus minus uh, multiply or divide. And then you can pass it to arguments and it will turn this into the corresponding expression. This just, you know, prevents or uh, relieves us from having to use an additional switcher. Uh, and these calls are themselves recursive. So at every point in this macro expansion, we're going to break off the result or the argument of this return statement and then substitute that into the thing it's calling it. So when we recursively call eval node for this left hand child, it's going to come up here again. Let's say it's a, a unary function and then we're going to break off the operand for the unary function and substitute that back in here. And by doing this, we can create a, uh, a single expression without any function calls. That's just pure math. And we can do that recursively. So it gives us like a fine grained way of recursively generating uh, expressions. So it's pretty easy to build this, right? Just, oops. I'm gonna lag on my terminal. So if you evaluate um, this RPN expression, giving these three arguments, and get back this number back out. What's what's neat now, I think. Uh, file type equals LL. Is that here's our function, um, and we can see that it's been lowered to just about nothing, right? Um, Yeah, it's pretty amazing. It's it's been it's just been lowered to to four to four instructions. So we see the the sign call and the pow call here, the sign call, and the pow call and the multiply, and and uh, and the divide. So all four of our operators are listed out here in order. So we've been able to kind of uh, you know perform all of this complicated uh, language interpretation, domain specific language interpretation, uh, at compile time, lower to something that that optimizes that to to really nice looking code. Last but not least, um, is a domain specific language for specifying um, gradients of ordinary vector algebra functions. So uh, the expressions themselves look like ordinary, ordinary functions. However, the kind of the DSL interpreter, the, the, the back end, the, the logic of this, this whole system will take this expression and yield us an optimized version of the reverse mode um, automatic gradient. So uh, this is kind of similar to a uh, analytical derivative that you've taken by hand in school, but it's really kind of factored to be very efficient when you have a lot of independent inputs, a lot of primary inputs and few primary outputs, which is the case for most machine learning uh, applications uh, or engineering applications. So what I find like really exciting about this um, exercise is that almost all of the logic is contained inside a shared object library, an SO. So uh, instead of defining everything in your uh, source code and having to parse potentially hundreds of thousands of lines of support code to, to do your operation and having to run that through a pretty slow interpreter, you can just like import uh, a .so and run that. And since we have a, since the interpreter implements the full Itanium C++ ABI, it ha it uses the same object layout, same V table layouts, uh, same name mangling scheme as the ordinary LLVM backend, so that you can interface seamlessly between interpreted code and compiled code. So we're going to want to um, take the derivative of this expression automatically. And then you know substitute in the values 0.3 and 0.5. So well, how do we do that? There is an automatic 
there's an auto diff code gen header file that has macro logic to lower an intermediate data structure called a tape to real code via macros, right? So the code gen here, is a macro <clears throat> and it takes this AD, which is um, automatic derivative uh, header. This is like an AST and it has many kinds of nodes. So there's a tape node, which is a memoized value. Uh, this is in a, it includes a, an index into this tape. And so um, there's two passes, right? So there's like a, like a, a an upsweep and a downsweep. So on, on, on the first pass, we, accumulate uh, partial derivatives into a tape. And on the second pass, we read them out and combine them with other derivatives to, to um, evaluate the gradient. Uh, it can be a numeric literal. So in this case, we just have a double. It can be a unary operator. And you've seen this, this operator uh, in the uh, pol reverse polar notation example. Or you can make a function call uh, to, to certain sort of um, carved out expressions like, like trig functions. So there's a, a fair amount of code here, and this is all in macros. Uh, this, this is all in macros, and this is a special meta function, which is like a normal function that has a uh, kind of a parametric or compile time known parameter um, for taking AST, in this case, it's the automatic derivative tape, and generating code from it. So this code right here is loaded into and parsed by the, um, by the circle compiler and run through the interpreter. And because it has macros and, and meta functions, it has to be run through the translation unit. However, most of the logic is actually compiled into that shared object. So we're gonna we include the auto diff header. This header has uh, declarations for the AST or the, the, the tape uh, hierarchy right here. And really importantly, it has a uh, forward declaration for the functions required to build the tape. And that, that function is implemented in this make auto diff uh, uh, function right here. So this is implemented in the shared object. It takes uh, the formula string and the list of variable names and it returns this big struct right here. Uh, this uh, indic this establishes the order of the tape, which is like all these um, kind of temporaries required to hold uh, partial derivatives and functions of partial derivatives uh, at runtime. Uh, and, and this lets us kind of generate code to, to achieve this operation. So we have like a full compiler pipeline. I believe we, it's, um, yeah, starts in, in token. So I ripped out a good section of the um, circle tokenizer and circle parser to support a really rich expression grammar. So here are all the, the tokens uh, enumerators. And then we have a tokenizer that you can use for any application. And this, again, this is implemented and compiled into a shared object. So, uh, you know, you've, you can parse numbers, decimal sequences, exponent parts. So like, how do you break apart and, and parse, um, you know, floating point values or string literals, all that supported. So, uh, you know, you just create an instance of the tokenizer object, then you can feed it some strings and you can get, get this token stream out. And the question is um, how to parse that token stream. So the, the grammar it's, you know, or uh, implement as ordinary recursive descent grammar as C++ compilers are. Um, and you can see all the, the grammatical names here, the production names. So you pass it a range and it matches an assignment expression and it may do this recursively. Like assignment expression requires a logical or and that requires logical and that requires a binary expression which has a whole host of precedences. And all of this code right here will be run at compile time as native code. And we could do it as interpreted code but we don't wanna you know, pay the cost and it's just nice to have something that, that, that builds immediately. Here are all the precedences for the different um, operators in C++ in the same precedence you'd expect. So what we do is we can parse uh, an expression like this as if it were a C++ expression and get a parse tree back out. And then, so that's, that's one step of what Apex does. And the second step is, the, is to build the tape from that parse tree. So if we look at the auto diff function, um, auto diff source code right here, we have this auto diff builder 
We have behavior for a lot of elementary functions and for operators. What, and how do we implement these behaviors? Well, we just use like freshman calculus uh, identity. So this is uh, the, uh, how do we add, and how do we take the derivative of a plus b, right? Uh, it's just the sum of the derivatives of the corresponding elements. Or for the product rule, what's the derivative of a times b? And here we see, well, you one of the terms is a times grad of b, and the other term is b times grad of a. So it's the, just from the product rule. And we go through and we implement a lot of calculus right here, which is necessary to do analytical or to do reverse mode derivatives. We're not doing numerical differentiation. We don't have to worry about um, our, our deltas and finding the uh, right sampling. This is all exact math. Um, we implement, um, you know, derivatives of, of logarithms, of exponents, of square roots, of trig functions. And it's really compact. You just have to, to annotate what operation you want. And what this lets us do, again, is lower to, um, to, to real code from this, from the string we have. So if we go back into the um, example program, Right, so here we're we're expanding, or we're, we're calling into this uh, meta function and providing it a string that's known at compile time, as well as values that are only known at runtime. Right, so that meta function is right here, auditive grad. Meta in front of a parameter means that value has to be known at compile time. It doesn't have to be a string literal; it just has to be known at compile time. And this can be uh, values that are known at runtime. So, um, right, so we, we, we pass this, um, we, we first construct the tape um, by calling make auto diff uh, at compile time. This is a meta object. So that will um, look, it hands it off to the interpreter. The interpreter looks through all the locally defined symbols and there is no symbol make auto diff defined. There's one forward declared, but it's not defined. But instead of just shrugging its shoulders and giving up, and you know, issuing some kind of compile time link error, it searches the list of binaries that have already been loaded, and it looks for that mangled name, that the mangled name of that symbol in those binaries. So if we just provide the shared object, it will be able to to call through that pointer that it finds in that shared object, and then run at full speed and return a full C++ object with all the ordinary C++ semantics. Uh, and then we can just uh, you know compute the tape in this case computing all the sub temporary sub-expressions into the tape. And then we're going to recurse down using uh, expression macros and evaluate our gradients. So that will call into these into these macros right here. So let's see how this let's see how this works. It's in the examples directory. So when we build we have to provide it not just the uh, header, which was Auditive code gen, but also the shared object. And we do that with a dash n. As it nears release, uh, lib apex. All right. So now we've got a a, um, a program built that prints out and co computes and prints out the gradient of this function evaluated at x equal 0.3, y equal 0.5. And let's confirm that it really does what we think it's doing. So here is the uh, mangled name of that of that function. Remember, it's called mygrad, and it, the function's mygrad, and it takes terms t as an argument. It's mygrad, it takes terms t. And so this right here has been replaced by this math. And so this is very, you know, this is typically dense L of M math. And there's some, um, these are some structures involved. That's why these these uh, shuffle vector and insert element calls are just to access the x or y elements, but otherwise it's all math. So let's wrap everything together into kind of a mega example. So here uh, I'm going to load in functions that are defined in JSON files. Which JSON file? Well, all the JSON files that happen to be in the in the working directory. So I've got formula.json, which is like a pretty pretty gnarly formula here, uh, with two objects, f1 and f2, and their associated functions. And then formula2.json with f3 and f4 and two more functions. So I'm going to use all these, and I'm going to uh, 
scrape over the directory at compile time. So when, when, the, when the program boots up, this is the global scope. So this will be executed. Uh, this is a, a just a declaration of the global scope. So I'm opening the current directory, working directory, with uh, OpenDir. And then I'm going to loop over all the, all the files in OpenDir at compile time. And I'm going to check the extension. So if the extension of the file is JSON, then I will uh, call, I will expand the gen functions macro on that file name. So in this case, it'll only match for those two JSON files. So I expect gen functions to be expanded twice. Now, what is gen functions? This really looks like that, that third, um, that meta three example. We're going to open up a, a JSON file because we've included JSON.hpp. We're going to loop through all the uh, objects in it. We're going to get the key value pair. So the key is called name and the value is called F. We're going to print out a diagnostic to help the user understand what the program is doing as it compiles. Then we're going to declare two more functions. So one is uh, F underscore name. So if the name is F1, this will be F underscore F1, F underscore F2, etc. This is just the regular function. So what do we do? We'll uh, this function is defined to take a vec3, but we're going to break that down into x, y, and z. Because if we look at the JSON, the JSON is defined in terms of x, y, and z being the function parameters. And for the for the non-grading case, just the ordinary function case, we're going to evaluate the expression directly. For the grading case, we're going to prefix the name of the function with grad uh, and then call autodiff grad. And that will, again, uh, Go into libapex.so, use that to parse the the, um, the input string, construct the intermediate tape data structure, and then the code in the codegen.hxx with the, the meta function of the macros will lower that into, into code that can be optimized by LLVM. And you end up getting functions for every object in the JSON that look like this. So it's, it's good code, and there's no evidence that this was actually written using a code generator, especially a code generator that's integrated and does all the parsing and stuff that's integrated right into your C++ translation unit. Finally, we're going to uh, push back the name of the function. We can do that so that we have a compile time array of function names. So we can build, essentially, a user interface. So func names is a compile time, some meta objects, compile time vector of strings just sitting out here in the global, global namespace. <clears throat> so when all of this code is completed, we can close the directory, we're going to have func names populated with all the, the function names. And so now we can create like a little driver program, a little user interface, and it's called eval. We'll pass it a string name and we'll pass it a uh, the value at which to compute this this gradient. So how do we co correlate the, you know, how do we how do we relate the, um, the name of the function to the function itself? Well, we'll just make a, a loop through uh, these memoized names. We'll compare uh, the provided name with uh, the, the with the string name in this 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 function. So this is a std vector of strings, and these strings are known at compile time. So we can't do a runtime comparison, but we can pull the compiled. We can marshal the compile time string into a string literal using at string. So string compare of name and f would fail because f's not known at runtime. It's only known at compile time. But at string of f is a string literal that is known at runtime. So now I have a runtime string compare with a runtime string. If those match, then we'll just perform name lookup on both the um, uh, forward function f underscore whatever the function name is and grad underscore whatever the function is and evaluate those at, at, at this uh, coordinate v and return a a new pair right so the pair is going to be a scalar for the forward function or for the for the um, ordinary function and a a vec3 for its gradient so again to compile this point into the include directory i have to load in the um, lib apex at compile time. So there's no runtime link, linker dependency. There is a compile time linker dependency, even though it uses a shared object. And we build. And so our diagnostics told us that we've generated four functions, f1, f2, f3, f4, just by scraping the JSON files from the directory. Uh, and now we also have a user interface. So let's try to use it.
prompts us. So it wants uh, the the format is grad three, the name of the function, and then values for x, y, and z. So let's do it on um, f three, for instance, right here. So it's exp of x squared plus y over z. Um, call that like 2.1, 1.3, and uh, minus 10 or something. Oops, grad four. And we get back out the the uh, this function f3 evaluated at these three values is 82.1, and rather majestically the <laughs> we have the the gradient as well. And the gradient was computed efficiently without uh, numerical derivatives using reverse mode automatic differentiation, and all the logic is is in a in a binary. So you pay really no compilation cost. You see um how fast it is to compile. And that's most of that, that you know, half second pause is to pull in the 21,000 lines of JSON parsing. That is all done uh, in the interpreter, but the all the, the mathematics work is done uh, in compiled code. So, okay, that's my, um, my new um, video walkthrough for Circle. I hope um, you're interested in the, in the in project and let me know what you think.